Schön. I'm delighted to see that there's so many of you. We're right at the end of the agenda. Monitoring success, however, doesn't sound like a very fascinating term. We use the term control in German. It sounds like checking up that people have got their tickets on public transport or checking that their passport is in order. But it's not that kind of control at all. It's more about monitoring. And I want to put forward sensible solutions, ones that are viable for everyday use. So how can you measure the success of an event? Here's an article from 2016 that I wrote. It was published in a journal called Tagungswirtschaft. I used this rather nice key visual up there. And the key term is the one you can see up there. The key expression lies in the questions. What? On the basis of which criteria? How? And when? I like to make things simple. But it's actually rather complex. But it's possible to convey things in a straightforward fashion. And I'm going to do that with these four key questions. Monitoring success actually involves four steps. The four steps that you can see up here. What is the first question? And that means what's supposed to be measured. Well, what we're looking at here is the target impact. So first of all, you have to establish the target impact, which is to be measured. That's the first crucial step, and you'll see that it's the most difficult. Secondly, which parameters should be used to measure this? It doesn't suffice just to say that you have a certain target impact. You need certain indicators. For example, imagine you've gone along to an event, and you're trying to sell products there. As your parameter, you could take the number of units sold and the turnover, or you could indeed take both. Product sales is not enough. It's too imprecise just to say product sales. You have to say exactly what you mean. And if you're looking at measuring your image, it gets a lot more complicated. I'll say more about that in a moment. Thirdly, how? How is it supposed to be measured? Measuring methods. This is the part which is a bit more tricky in methodological terms. Because unless you have some basic know-how in market research, it becomes difficult to monitor the success of an event. You need to have a basic grasp of what it's all about. And to understand which measuring methods really are most appropriate. And that's very closely linked to the fourth and last question, when? When should the measurements be taken? And of course, the success of an event might vary as the event unfolds. So the point in time when the measurements are taken is certainly relevant. And the fifth and last point is the overall measurement per se. That's not what we're looking at as such. We're looking at the essential way that we conceive of and design this sort of system. So on the first question, the intended impact, the target effect. What then is generally measured in our sector by associations or clients who commission an event? What do they actually measure? I hold a whole host of presentations on this topic. And the kind of questions you find are the following. Did travel to the event run smoothly? Were the people you were seated with agreeable? Were the chairs comfortable? Was the temperature in the room acceptable? Was the food good? Were the drinks cold? Did everyone feel comfortable, have a good chat, and present discussion? And then there are parameters such as the number of attendants, number of participants, number of people who said thank you. 
perhaps write a thank you note afterwards, the number of reports in the press. And then, of course, there's the inevitable smiley questionnaire. You get them at every single Italian restaurant you go to nowadays as well. And so you have the spectrum from unhappy smileys to happy smileys. How did you enjoy your visit today is the question. That's all fine and dandy. But as you'll see, this kind of monetary of the success and event is often exactly the kind of thing you'd find at a private event. That doesn't mean there's no point in it. It just means that that's not the whole story. You have to go further. These are just the first steps. These are the basic factors. They're all important. They're all correct. The statistics on the number of participants are quite correct. And you'll see later that you can have slightly more subtle methods, but I'll talk about that later. And of course, how contented the participants are is also important. Participant satisfaction is essential. Were you happy with the organization? How good were the speakers? Were the speeches too long? Was the content correct? That's all fine, like I said. But this is really just the foundation. It's just the starting point after that. You need something else, and the question is, what? The point's the following. Here you've got Garfield to get my idea across. The whole point at events is not to make sure the guests just have a nice meal and go home full. If you're planning it in those terms, you can measure it in those terms. But that's actually all just a means to an end. More comfortable chairs, good catering, perfect technology, the right temperature in the room. That's all important, but it's all a means to an end. And that end is a different one. Communication. Events are platforms for communication. And in keeping with that, we can't just measure the success of an event in these kind of logistical factors, comfortable chairs and the right temperature, good catering and so on. That's not the whole point. The whole point relates to messages which the audience picks up and takes home with them, communication goals. And I hear often have the feeling that people are a bit horrified by that, saying, what, communication goals? Well, yes. You can achieve all kinds of things at an event. You can trigger and stir up emotions. And those emotions, of course, are in the realm of feelings. They tend to be subconscious psychological processes. <coughs> And now you realize that it's getting a little more complex. You can't just peer into people's heads. So the question is how it's possible to convey black and white on paper how people are feeling. And events can also transmit information. These are the rational, conscious psychological processes. These are processes like understanding and learning. And then you have action, motivating action, that means, for example, motivating people to recommend a product. And events can also trigger actions. And action is, of course, any kind of observable action. Some manuals say events can't sell anything, and I think that's just wrong. They can sell much better than any other marketing tool. If you think about Steel, for example, presenting a new electric saw outside a DIY market. I love that kind of event. They're great. And afterwards, you can look at the sales figures, and you'll see the impact that it has. Of course, it works, especially when you think of actions at the point of sale. So the building that we're talking about looks a little different. So you've got the ground floor, you've got these solid foundations, but then comes the rest, emotions, information, motivation. There are elements which affect all of these parameters. There are stances or attitudes, but there's also the term image. And therefore, you have complex constru constructs. We have, for example, emotion, information, and motivation all intermeshed. Complex constructs. Just think of the term image there. You'll know what's meant. And then there are the actions which is the icing on the cake, in a sense. It's the climax of this house. So moving people to act 
is really the most difficult thing, and it's the greatest achievement. And all of those together that make an event successful, it's not just the ground floor, that's the prerequisite for what comes subsequently. And put it in different terms, if you like. There are logistical elements, and psychological elements, and behavioral elements. So you've got logistical static effects at the base, participant stats and participant satisfaction, then you have the psychological effects, and then you've got the third floor, the behavioral effects. So let's take a look at these one by one. And I'll give you some ideas as to the aspects that you can take into account at your next event. So events should convey messages. There are occasions for personal encounters and communication. The ultimate goal of events is to transmit messages, not to make sure that guests have a good meal. Measuring the impact of the communication in terms of communication goals is at the heart of measurement of success. The problem is that events don't tell you what their communication goals are. Well, we should do something with our customers. That's the kind of sentence that I hear. But the actual goals over and above that are not really articulate. It's all not fine to get together and have a nice, cozy evening. That's often the trigger for events, but it's not enough in and of itself. So you need to encourage your clients to define their communication goals. When you're looking at measuring the success of an event, the initial problem doesn't lie in the actual measurement process. It has a lot more to do with the actual goals. You can't measure the goals unless you have goals, and then you can't be successful. So setting goals is essential if you want to be successful, but often the client cannot tell you any goals. And as a good advisor, internally or externally, you have to take the initiative yourself. Either you encourage the client to come up with some goals, well, if they don't, then proactively you can come up with some yourself and give the client the impression that they've invented those goals themselves. That's the way to proceed as a good advisor. But you also need to think about the goals of the client and of the your consultancy firm, for example. BFSF knows that the question of the environment can be a negative market force for them. Innovation can be a positive market force for them and competence as well. And the consultancy services offered in tandem with the products. Now, brand driver analyses, analyzing the factors that drive the brands are crucial. They look at the factors that have the greatest effect, positive or negative. You can use these as levers and you can distill information out of that. You can say this is interesting in the event, this is the topic in the event. For example, you can look at perceptions of environmental friendliness, and the goal would be to augment perception of the company's environmental friendliness. That's the way that you arrive at your goal. What are the criteria to be used in measuring this? We're looking at parameters, and here you can see KPI sometimes just PI, performance indicators. These are indicators, of course, as the word says itself. And the whole point is to have an indicator that measures what needs to be measured. But often goals are formulated in very unclear terms. Now, not all goals can be directly measured. There are those that can be quantified statistically. For example, the sales curve, number of units sold. I was talking before about that DIY store with a special event for the saw. That works fine there, but it doesn't work that way for every event. For example, you want to improve a company's image. As a consultant, I've often heard clients say to me, OK, we want to improve our image with this event. And I say, well, what exactly 
What do you want to improve about your image? An image is multidimensional with many facets. It's not something unified. It really can be divided into a whole host of different facets. Do you want to improve the environmental compatibility, the design competence? Do you want to improve customer service, be more friendly to your customers? You need to be more precise and stipulate what you mean. You need to operationalize what you're doing. If you say you want to improve your image, ultimately, that's not really a goal that can be put into practice. And these parameters are essential. They're decisive when it comes to attaining goals. And here, you can take the marketing concept of the client as your lodestone. Here I'd like to give you some examples. And please remember, these are just selected examples. It's not the whole story. Selected performance indicators for these areas. And that's why I've got that red stamp up there, examples. I don't want anyone to think this is the complete list. If you want to know more, then I'll say more about it later. I'll tell you how you can achieve that and find out more. But for now, we're just looking at a few selected parameters to make it more tangible. Statistics on participants. Most people will say, well, yes, fine, the number of participants. But let's not just look at that. Let's also look at the structure of the participants. That becomes more interesting from which sector, in which position, holding which, having which function within the company. Furthermore, I always like to advise people to look at this in terms of the marketing funnel, the degree of customer loyalty. If you don't know what's meant by that, then let me show you here very briefly. This is the marketing funnel. You can adapt it to suit your own needs. So this marketing funnel works as following. It segments clients in terms of their degree of loyalty to the firm. So you have a high degree of loyalty at the bottom of this funnel. And you can segment participants in your event to see whether they've already heard of the company, been in contact with the company, if they're interested in the company's products, have perhaps purchased them, purchased them repeatedly, or indeed repeat customers. That's useful in terms of segmentation and provides you with more information. At trade fairs such as this one, you have customer contacts established and potential sales established subsequently. So you can find leads. You should list these leads amongst clients and then follow up subsequently. What happened with those leads? And then, as you'll recall, this is the funnel structure. You've got the participant satisfaction. I'd advise you to ask them about the event in general. All in all, if you had to appraise this event overall, what mark would you give to the event? And you'll get a mark like you get a mark at school for your performance. That gives you an overall impression of the event. In addition, you can ask detailed questions. For example, how happy people are with the catering, with the length of the speeches, with the content of the speeches, with the speakers, with the organizational logistics. I'm sure you can think of a whole long list. You'll have to restrict that list and keep it fairly short. The next point would be emotions. And that's something which is the most difficult to measure. Emotions are very intangible, but I'll show you how you can make those more tangible. So when you're talking about emotions, there is the emotional impressions or mood at the particular moment. It's very volatile. It's ephemeral. Shortly after the event, it's quite possible that participants will appraise the event differently than they did during the event. Once the event is over and all of the experiencing is over, our brain begins to process what we've experienced. Cognitive reflection is what you get at that point. If you want to grasp people's emotions, cognitive reflections get in the way. That means reflecting on 
what you've experienced. It's not emotion, it's reflection on that emotion, it's cognition. That might sound a bit cumbersome and unwieldy, but it's important. You want to get a sense of people's emotions as directly as possible if you want to have an authentic representation of them, either during the event, immediately afterwards. If it's a long time afterwards, it, it makes little sense because the emotional situation during the event is not authentically conveyed if you appraise this a long time after the event. And I'll show you an instrument in a moment that you can use for this. And there's other parameters. It's not just feelings or moods when you think about emotions. There is, for example, identification with one's task. That's important for team buildings or how well one identifies with one's own company. There's the sense of belonging, not just belonging to one's own firm. But think of a trade fair like this one. The motivation to take part is not just to learn something, but also to meet colleagues. You meet year after year at the ITB. It's a bit like a big family. And of course, there's an emotional component there. That can be one good reason to come along to the trade fair. And then you have networking as well. A great deal of that is going on too, and that's a reason for being part of the family and establishing new contacts and extending one's social networks. That's all part and parcel of emotions. Just examples, as I said. And then there's information, recall of content, brand recall as well. That's simply how well known your brand is, how well people remember it. And there's also the question of the perceived credibility of a certain statement. I mentioned BSF before. That wasn't entirely coincidentally. I once had the good fortune to advise this company, and a lot of important things came into being as a result of the perceived credibility of the messages. If you think about the chemical industry, that's a very important cognitive criterion. For example, if they're thinking about improved environmental friendliness, that may well be the case de facto, but it's hard to get this message across credibly. The general public doesn't really accord much credibility to the big players in the chemical chemicals industry. We do that in marketing all the time. We're always dealing with positive and negative prejudices. So the perceived credibility of messages is a cognitive criterion. It's an important one in certain sectors. Think of the insurance sector. Something fairly similar applies to that as well. They also have a problem with that. There's this idea of sales agents going around and pushing old grannies to buy policies they don't need, and so on and so forth. Motivation. This is all related to intentions, propensity to do something. You have the intention to purchase something, the propensity to purchase something. Would you like to purchase this product? Or if you don't wish to purchase the product, would you recommend it to someone else? So the willingness to recommend the product, those are key motivational parameters. Then there are the complex construct, that's the image. Relevant items need to be specified. Exactly how do you want to improve it and exactly how do you want to measure it? And then you have action, sales and purchases and repurchases and recommendations, not just a propensity to do so, but actual recommendations. Feedback in the media and the tenor of those reports in the press. And of course, nowadays, Internet activities play an increasingly important role. Live commentaries from users, shares, likes, file download. That can already be readily measured. All of that data is available digitally. So that then was an overview, so you can see how it's possible to take these measurements. They were performance indicators. It was a kind of spectrum of different options. You can pick 
from that. You can cherry pick what's best for your event. That was the best of, in a sense, but it's not by any manner of means the whole story. Then we come to the question of how. How is all of this supposed to be measured? Measuring methods. And I want to say, unless you have basic know-how in market research, you won't really manage to do this. You're looking at surveys, interviews, and statistical evaluations. Statistical evaluations are all valuable, but you have to think about the, the way that the questions are asked. I came across this question recently. Did you like this event? Yes or no? So what's wrong with that question? Well, there's several things wrong with it, actually. So what is wrong with this question? Who knows? Comments of Mike. It's a bit of an overall question, a bit of a global question. It's all right to ask global questions, but look at the answers that you offer them. Either yes or no. No differentiation between yes and no. What you really need here is a scale of responses. But you just have a dichotomy, yes or no, one or the other. What you're actually looking for is a continuum, a kind of scale of one to five, let's say. That's the first mistake. And the second mistake is that the question isn't put properly. If you were to say, what kind of mark would you give to this event overall? You've got the word liking, not liking. It's just not really worded very well. But the most important thing that's missing is this scale. And you have to understand about how these skills work. Well, it's OK to have yes, no questions. So in some cases, they're useful and they do make sense. For example, that's the case if you ask somebody, are you one of our customers, yes or no? There, you can have these kinds of um, things. But um, when you have more complex questions, you have to think about the scale. And then there's the question of whether you're using standardized market research. It does the following if you look at emotions. You have these kind of couples, pairs of adjectives presented to you, trying to grasp your emotions. Are you happy? Are you unhappy? Are you are you tired, perhaps, uh, worn out? Those are all questions that can try to uh, approximate emotions through words, but that's not very sensible. Most uh, quicker and easier way is uh, by means of a tool that I always like to present because it uh, fulfills certain prerequisites that are very important for event organizers, specifically if these measurements take place during the event. It has to be quick and it has to be precise, it has to be simple, and it, in the ideal case, should also be fun. So how can we achieve that uh, event control that uh, is fun. It should not even look like event control. That's when it starts actually being fun. And uh, in certain circumstances, and given the right target groups, technology might be helpful there. Specifically, managers might be interested in that. So it might be a good way to uh, approach the subject. Let's look at this one here. This is a tool that uh, I always like to recommend. and. Uh, I'm always surprised to see that it's hardly known or is hardly used. It is a method of nonverbal emotional recording, if you will. I don't like exactly the way it is uh, presented here, the self-assessment mannequin. Uh, mannequin is a Jewish term that was then uh, translated into American English, which is uh, this figure, and it is uh, the self-evaluation. And you don't need to spell out more than this. It looks very simple, very simple figure. You have the typical smiley scale at the beginning. So from very unhappy to very happy. But uh, the special point is as follows. There's a second and indeed even a third level that is added to that. Most uh, emotion scales are limited to this first row. That is so-called uh, uh, values, i.e positive or negative emotions. 
But that's not the end of the story because emotions can be much more complex. What they also need is the uh, the strength of the emotion as well, and that's the uh, level of uh, strength of the emotion. At this point, it's still very subdued, and at that point, it's almost uh, uh, tearing apart the figure. That's not what you want to achieve in your event. The middle figures would be the ones that you would like to achieve. And the third point, which is also very, very important, does not have to be always important, but can be very important, is this here, the dominance, if you will. In this case, you're the boss in the ring, if you will, and on the other hand, you're relegated to the sidelines there. I uh, once had the honor to uh, conceive the marketing and event controlling for um, a large group, and that's when we used this diagram. We debated with the management, and, uh, and on, as among, amongst equals, and that uh, isn't very often the case, really. So in this case, we tried to use this as a con this scale as a control, in order to uh, avoid this kind of dominance or overbearing dominance, or. Is it completely uh, relegated? I think it's not as encompassing, but in some cases it can be very, very useful. And very, very important is to have at least two dimensions when recording and measuring emotions. Not just the kind of emotion, but also the degree of emotion, the degree of uh, or the strength of the emotion. And that really works on a nonverbal level. And you can. Uh, do so uh, also uh, verbally. Not every budget can cover that, but if you uh, have a sufficient budget, then you uh, use an iPod Touch, for example, or tablet, and uh, program the right program. And with uh, two, three clicks, participants can immediately react to that kind of uh, questionnaire. And uh, that's how you record emotions. We did so in uh, this particular case. It worked very well. We had the right. Uh, target group. This was uh, a group of people who were very much versed in technology and very much interested in uh, technological, technological development. So they immediately uh, uh, and enthusiastically uh, adopted this means. It's not something that works with every group. So you need to know who your target group is, who the people uh, are that you're trying to address, and how interested they are in t technology. And at some point, uh, where uh, smart uh, phones become so ubiquitous, and you can use uh, event apps in order to record that particular moment. I already mentioned this. Event control should not even look and feel like an event control. It should look quite different, actually, and should be perceived differently. Event control should resemble an element of uh, the mise-en-scene and, uh, if you will, the feeling of the entire event. So it should be used as an element in the setup of uh, the event. For example, you can use uh, questionnaires in the form of games or uh, set up a, a quiz as a kind of competition. So there's a, there's a, a playful element that comes in here that could uh, make it seem effortless. Or audience response systems can uh, also work add to the excitement, uh, create a cliffhanger moment, if you will, i.e. people are in suspense waiting to know uh, what the result will be, who will achieve a majority. So those are moments uh, of suspense or live commentaries, that polling that can be used in order to record the general sentiment in the audience regarding certain topics. You can do this, but only if you plan it from the very beginning, from the very outset, when you're planning your evidence, then it no longer comes across as a kind of event controlling or effort, but it is part as a, uh, or is an integral part of the event itself. Push and pull services, um, exhibits where uh, the participants receive additional information on their handheld devices. Uh, via push services, they can achieve or can have access to additional information. That can also be used. Uh, as a means of recording uh, the general atmosphere, or mobile event guides, if you have, uh, if you distribute uh, handheld devices for navigation purposes, they can also be used in order to uh, flag up certain questions uh, that can be answered 
during the event. And this brings me to the last question. At what time and point, point in time should measurements take place? And I'll be a bit preemptive here at this point because it can happen very quickly. But there are a number of possibilities that need to be borne in mind, and there are certain uh, consolations that are that serve the purpose, others that don't really serve the purpose. I'll just uh, give you my experience on that. The uh, event controlling really depends, and the success of it depends on its being fully embedded in the entire procedure of the event. It can be uh, uh, seen as an interference, as uh, something of an uh, of a, uh, an unpleasant. Uh, uh, Hiatus, but it shouldn't be that. It shouldn't be a kind of showstopper. Situations like that can occur, and one has to learn to deal with them. But I think the best way to go forward is to be as discreet as possible and use it as a, an element of the overall mise en scène. Use downtimes, for example, people waiting at the entrance. That's when it is uh, l least perceived as something that is a, uh, of an interference or bothering at all. But um, if uh, data collection is uh, not welcome during the event, then try to do so or try to enact it afterwards online, for example. But there's a certain um, bracket that I open up here because emotions can only be really uh, reliably recorded during the event or shortly after the event, not uh, after a lengthy period. If you uh, look at this uh, as a kind of a uh, timeline, you have a run-up, then the event itself, and then the follow-up. And controlling could take on the following shape. You uh, offer a questionnaire during the online um, registration. Somebody wishes to participate in your event, then you could uh, add for example, three important questions to that online registration. Uh, for zero measurement, that's enough. If you have uh, the most important questions at the beginning, if you uh, are able to ascertain the situation as it is before the event, and then in the follow-up, see what kind of changes took place. So you could uh, have some questions, not too many, maximum three to five that are easily and uh, quickly answered. Second point immediately before the event takes off at the entrance if there's a certain queue, for example, and if it can be expected that uh, queues uh, build up there, then you could send out people to uh, ask questions or during breaks. But that should really be, during the event, really uh, should really be the exception then. At the immediate uh, exit of the event, end of the event, people leaving the event, uh, that is a possibility. And uh, I think uh, online uh, questionnaires immediately after the event, and that really means immediately after the event, then the response rates are also much higher than uh, if you let a certain time lapse before providing that question. And this brings me to the end of these, this brief overview. And I would like to ask the question that I would probably have to ask, should have asked at the beginning. What is the purpose of this? It leads to better events. The purpose of event controls is that it is not about controlling, as it is known in German, or as the term is used in German. It's really about steering the event towards success. And it really becomes very clear, because in German, uh, control has a complete different connotation. In English, it is about steering and guiding, and only at that point does it become a form of supervision or control. But controlling also requires a systematic objective management and definition, something that is not really the rule, rather the exception in the event area, and uh, that has a lot to do with external uh, aspects uh, um, clients who don't have clear objectives and don't know exactly what objectives, objectives they want to set for their events, um, lacks and uh, lacuna that exist, for example, also in the marketing strategy of a corporation. But, um, uh, and actually, this kind of uh, objective management or setting of objectives is not really as ubiquitous as one might assume. It is really much more the exception than the rule.
but you can learn also. If you look at uh, events that are recurrent events that take place every year, then you can start uh, benchmarking these against uh, each other, or you can start comparing them and see how they develop over the a certain time. You can develop questions to that uh, purpose, and then you can see and pinpoint uh, perhaps the uh, strong moments and the weaker moments of the event. But that's only something that you can do. And then, of course, at the end, uh, um, controlling is a business factor. It's about uh, improving the business, and that is something that uh, also uh, is very much to the liking of the controllers, i.e., if uh, the money comes and the cash comes rolling in and you've done your homework and you measured your event and the success rate of your event, then you can show that uh, to the controllers in your uh, company and the probability is then uh, very high that uh, they will not cost co cut costs for your department because very often it is the case that you have sales that say we're earning all the money and all the other departments are simply spending it and then uh, communications says uh, uh, you know, those are these very creative people with funny ties and uh, that's usually where they start cutting costs and my experience has been that events are a communication instrument is that is uh, that is very impactful much more has much more impact and is much more effective than many other communication tools. I've uh, measured uh, the effect of uh, events three months prior and three months after the events, and I can tell you, and I measured how how much remained of uh, the communication strategy, and uh, three months later it was still very, very high. And I don't believe that any other communication tool um, has such an impact uh, and is uh, so long-lasting in its effect. But you need to have a muster the courage to measure it. And uh, my then customer who had uh, contracted me, he said, uh, that's the kind of values that I'll use. This kind of result is what I'll use when I negotiate my pay rise. That's what you have to do. Uh, event management has to be, um, be self-confident and this instrument is so effective and it has such a long-lasting effectiveness that every cent invested in this tool is well invested. Well, a brief uh, publicity bracket at the end. If you really want to get very much into detail, please uh, join us at VDVO. That is uh, one of the organizers also, the, one of the organizations behind the MICE Forum. And uh, perhaps you can just uh, attend some of the events of the Mice Minds because the VDVO uh, organizes uh, working groups, members of the so-called mastermind groups, and uh, on different topics. One of the topics is success measurement, success control, and the, uh, um, this is facilitated by experts. And uh, the positive story is that uh, the results are then f forwarded to all members and uh, further uh, fleshed out in additional workshops. I personally participate. I'm a member of the VDVO. If you're not a member, please become a do become a member because it is really an added value for all members. So join the Mice Minds. That was my final statement. Thank you very much for your attention.